All right. Hey, good morning, North Point. How we doing? All right. Hey, um, my freshman year of college, we had a trash problem. Yeah. Um, obviously, we were 18-year-olds moving in together. Most of my college career, I lived with a, a guy named A.J. Brown. Uh, A.J. and I are still really good friends to this day. Uh, he was the starting left tackle for most years uh, on our college football team. And so A.J. was just um, slightly bigger than me, right? Okay, <laughs> makes sense, all right. Uh, and so we lived in a tiny dorm room. It was a cinder block room that was like 10 by eight. So everything in a dorm room has to be small, right? You've got mini desks, mini fridge, bunk beds. And one of the things that we had in our tiny room uh, was a mini trash can, right? It was only about this big, small little thing. Um, and we found out like fairly early on that AJ and I had a lot more trash every day than this tiny little trash can could contain. Uh, and so what we would do is we would fill this thing up. It would begin to pour out a little bit. And every single day, we had to take our tiny little trash can down three flights of stairs, out the back door, all the way down to the dumpster and dump it. There was no like convenient way to do this. It wasn't like on the way to class. No trash fairy came and was like, hey, can I assist you with that? Like none of that ever happened for us. It was every single day, tiny trash can would fill up. You'd have to go back down. You'd go down the stairs. You'd dump the trash can. You'd come back up. Then the next day, trash can would fill up. And again and again. And again, and I remember getting so exhausted with doing this because 18-year-old uh, Jake, who like knew everything, obviously knew that I had obviously taken the trash out like way more than AJ had ever taken the trash out, okay? Uh, but like I said, AJ was bigger than me, so I wasn't gonna have that conversation with the guy who could throw me out the window. So uh, I just decided I'm not taking the trash out anymore. Like I have done my fair share. I'm just gonna let it be. It can be AJ's problem. And the crazy part of this is AJ had the same thought. He was done taking the trash out too. Only he thought I was gonna do it. And because we were very smart uh, freshman college students, we never discussed these new ideas or principles with one another. We just let that little trash can overflow and then the days became weeks. And it began to pile up. And when I say pile up, I'm not talking like, oh, there's a little on the floor. No, we had a three-foot-tall pile of trash mound in the corner of our room, like all the way over there, right? And now you're thinking, oh, Jake, that's, that's disgusting. Yeah, yeah, no, it was really gross, <laughs> like really gross. And you're thinking, man, that's a small room. Did that smell bad? Yeah, yeah, no, it smelled really bad, really, really bad. But don't worry, we were 18 and smart, and so what we did is uh, I went out and I bought something so that every single day, several times a day, we would Febreze our trash pile. <laughs> yeah, so it didn't smell like rotting trash, it smelled like rotting flowers all the time in our room. Uh, so what happened is our resident assistant, our RA for the hall, had a random cleanliness check for the hall for some reason, and so he gave us a heads up that he was coming in and AJ and I realized, like, we had to do something. We knew we'd get in trouble, so we have to make this look good. And so uh, we made our mamas proud, and we swept the floor. We even bought a mop and mopped the floor. We bought a duster. Yeah, we dusted everything. Like, books were in order. Our sheets were tucked in. We fabrized the entire room. Like, it was really, really good. We cleaned every single speck of that room, except the giant pile of trash in the corner that AJ was supposed to take out, I thought. So what happened is our resident assistant walks in and he takes two steps in, does a quick scan of the room and he goes, guys, this is phenomenal. I have never seen a room that is this, what is that over there? <laughs> well, we had to explain to him that, you know, I had done my fair share and AJ did his fair share and the trash just kind of piled up. Uh, and then he yelled stuff about like health codes and violations and fines or something like that. And uh, so AJ and I realized like we've got we've to handle this issue. And so uh, we thought long and hard of how to fix it. And we went out and we bought a bigger trash can. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, the crazy part was uh, it delayed us taking out the trash, but it still didn't take out the trash, and it actually didn't stop that thing from getting full and piling over from time to time. Uh, there was still a little bit of trash problem no matter what we did because we had to take out the trash. And, and truth of the matter is, we cleaned that entire room, but no matter what, we still had a trash problem. See, we're working through uh, our series, as Rick said, uh, we're calling it Old School Teaching, and we're just looking at passages in the Old Testament, uh, some sayings, some ideas, some principles that, man, they are still true. Like, they may be old, but they are still true for us today. There's some great things that God can speak to and can teach us here today. Uh, if you were here last week when Rick kicked it off, man, he had a great message on the Sabbath. 
Like for a busy world that we live in, the ability to recognize our need for rest, man, if you weren't here or you weren't streaming online uh, last week, like go back and check that out. It was so encouraging. Uh, it's great, great stuff. But today, uh, we're gonna jump into the book of Micah. Uh, this is one of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, a lot of people don't spend a lot of time in the prophets because they can be a little weird to read if you don't know all of the context. Like, all, uh, like they seem kind of angry or like distraught and like a lot of things are happening and it can be weird. And so uh, before we get into it, I just wanna help us understand a little bit of, of who Micah is and what's going on. So uh, the book of Micah is written by a guy named... Micah, hey, big surprise right there, okay? Uh, Micah was a prophet to the uh, split kingdoms of Israel and Judah. That when God established a nation, he had one nation, the nation of Israel. Uh, due to some conflict and some leadership issues, it actually split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of uh, Judah. And Micah's writing this letter to both of them, but he's kind of prominently speaking uh, to Judah. One of the crazy and fun things about the book of Micah is that there's actually some prophecies about Jesus in there. That 700 years before Jesus was born, Micah actually prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. And because of Micah, we have songs like O Little Town of Bethlehem now that we sing around Christmas. Like all of these things were, are cool parts about who Micah is and what he wrote about. The main purpose of the book of Micah, though, was that he's writing to leaders uh, who were really looking for their self-interest, leaders who were really all uh, about their selves here. Uh, and, he, and he wants to deal with the sin issues that they had going on because the truth is they're, the civil leaders of these nations in this time period, man, they were failing their people. They were failing their people. They were working for their own gain instead of the betterment of their community, instead of the betterment of the nation. And they would actually illegally seize property from poor citizens. And they would work to, to gain and preserve their own wealth and power and that kings and rulers of the time uh, began to worship idols and bow down to false gods and rejected the one true God. And so civil leaders were failing their people. In fact, it wasn't just them, but religious leaders were failing their people too. That what would happen is uh, these prophets at the time, a lot of them would accept bribes from these religious leaders and they would go and they would tell people that, hey, uh, everything's good. Everything's good. Like, like the nation and the kings were completely ignoring the things that God had required of them, but these prophets would accept bribes and they'd come back and say, hey, guys, like everything is good. Everything is awesome, Right, like God is so happy for us. Uh, King pays me a lot, wanted me to let you know that God really likes him, right? And they would like prophesy and take all of this stuff, but, but it was lies. These religious leaders were, were failing their people. Basically, anybody who was in any form of power or influence were putting on a show. They worked to make it look like they cared about the things that mattered to God. But man, they were just had ulterior motives, that they were really looking out for self. It was all about smoke and mirrors with these guys. Uh, they looked and played the part, but man, it was just an act. They would selfishly use the name of God for their own benefit instead of helping push their people to trust and believe and know more about God. In fact, it was religious politics at its finest. And in the midst of all this, Micah shows up and he begins to prophesy and speak out against it. So if we're gonna translate that kind of till today, uh, like that, that still looks for us, like mankind is still doing some of the same stuff that we've always done. Like these ideas may be old, but they're still true here. Uh, what would happen here, uh, we would see religious leaders today that, man, they still claim Jesus, but really they're just picking and choosing things out of the Bible to fit their own agenda. Like they, they kind of just pick the things that they like or they use the Bible as a weapon to push their own beliefs instead of a tool to, to mold after what it is that God has called for us and the things that Jesus loves. And we've got civil leaders today all over the world that still push agendas for their own gain, whether it's, it's money, whether it's uh, power or influence, instead of the betterment of their people that they should be leading, that every issue becomes a way to just kinda increase their brand instead of helping those that are marginalized. Now look, there's really good religious and civil leaders in our world today. Like there are lots of people who are, who are pushing and championing the right causes at great sacrifice to themselves and that really care and do great stuff. But we can also understand a time period in a culture where man, manipulation was around just like it was during Micah's time because some of that still happens today. So like, what do we do with that? What do we do with that level of brokenness? Well, here's the truth. It, it's not just those in leadership positions that, that kind of play the game. It's not just those that, that make the room look clean when there's a bunch of trash sitting in the corner. See, most of us in some area of our life, whether it be uh, our work, whether it would be uh, our family, our friends, our dating, our kids, our social media presence, like we try to put on this face while hiding the dirt in the background. 
Like those closest to us may have an idea of kind of what's going on for us, uh, but the rest of the world really sees exactly what it is that we want them to be able to see. They see the best image of us. They see uh, the most put together, the happiest version, the strongest version of ourselves that we can put out there for the rest of the world to see. But we can't hide our trash forever. Like not only is it exhausting to do, but it, it's really pointless. Because until we align our heart and our desires with God, all that we're really doing and acting and portraying, man, it's just gonna delay the end result. It's just gonna delay the end. And this is what Mike is talking about here. We're gonna jump into chapter six, and Mike is gonna give us some great principles and truths here. But he's writing here in chapter six, and Micah writes to the people of Judah, and he says, hey, look, you've got a God who took you out of slavery. You've got a God who's protected you from foreign enemies, who, who has chosen you. Why, why are you rejecting him? Why are you worshiping other gods? Why do you like do these fake sacrifices and all this fake stuff? Man, when your heart is so far from him, and you're really only looking out for yourself. Like, why do you do these kinds of things? And then Micah jumps here into in chapter six, verse six and seven, if you wanna follow along. And he asks this question simply, what does God want? And he says this in verse six, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? With 10,000s of rivers of oil shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. See right here, Micah is uh, kind of painting this picture of like these increasing acts of, of, of reverence or things that you can do to try and, and please God. And he says, hey, I, I bow down before God and worship him. I give, I give calves, I offer all these rams and, and the tons and tons of like oil to him. I'd even get my own, like our own children for that. And Micah's not like saying, hey, you should absolutely like sacrifice your child. No, he's, he's speaking here in hyperbole. He's saying, look, we can do more and more and more things all the time, but it doesn't matter. Like, it's not about the stuff. It's not about putting on this appearance. It's not about trying to accomplish more or do more or get more check marks next to your name. The idea of doing more and more acts to try and get on God's good side or to be in the club. Like, if we're to, we're to kind of translate this for us today, this would be like saying, hey, look, I've attended, like, every single church service ever, okay? Like, I give, and I give a lot, all right? Uh, I, I change diapers, in the nursery once a month. I work in the food pantry on Thanksgiving. Um, let's see, I, I've gone to every Bible study that's ever been offered. I did a missions trip to uh, Ecuador. I sponsor 13 World Vision children. Uh, I donated my old car that was only partially rusty to somebody who needed it uh, beforehand. I've got every Christian artist saved as a favorite on Spotify, and I have hashtag Jesus on my Facebook profile picture, right? But da bing, right? Like, we can do all of these Things And some of them are really, really good to do. Like they're, they're helpful in our walk, but the reality is it's not about doing all this stuff. Why? Because man, it, it just misses the point. It's not about the what of doing. It's about the why. And Micah is pointing out the absurdity that the people were using sacrifices here, that they were, they were going through the motions to kind of get this entry fee to God rather than using them as a way for God to give his grace and mercy. That it was about going through the motions. It was about keeping up appearances or looking like things were good when in reality, man, there was just trash in the corners of their hearts. They were just Febrezing it with something that smelled nice on the outside. So here's the thing, we can look Christian and still have a heart that's full of trash. We can look Christian and still have a heart that's full of trash. In fact, uh, if on Easter Sunday you post, he is risen, and then you post hatred and anger to somebody who has a different political, social, or whatever belief to you on your back to work Monday, man, you've got trash in the corners of your heart. If you can sing about the unending grace and mercy of Jesus from your Spotify playlist, but you're still holding on that grudge to the family member from years ago, hey, you've got trash in the corners of your heart. If you proudly display all the compassion children that you sponsor on your fridge, but you're not pouring Jesus into your home, hey, you've got trash in the corners of your heart. Look, don't get me wrong, nobody's perfect at this. Like, but for the grace of God and through Jesus, like we're all broken individuals. We all struggle with sin. We all have issues in there. But when we're pursuing a life fully devoted to Jesus, man, it's no longer about playing a part or checking off like certain actions or, or, or beginning to fit 
a mold in our life. It's about the heart that is pursuing Jesus with every ounce of who we are, knowing that when we get closer to Jesus, man, our actions, they're just gonna begin to mirror his. Get the right heart and the actions are gonna follow behind. In fact, Micah says this in verse eight, he puts it this way, it could be old, but it's so true here. I love this, verse eight, he says this, he has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is where we're gonna spend a little time here this morning. See, Micah answers his question, of what is it that God requires of his followers? He says, look, it's not about the sacrifices or the actions or the appearances. Look, it is so much deeper, so much more genuine than that. And so Micah gives us three broad principles that show us what it is that God requires of us when we claim Jesus in our life. And the very first one that he lists here, he says, hey, do justice. Do justice. And what he means by that is to act in a just and fair way towards others. Growing up, you probably heard it this way. Hey, treat others as the way you wanna be treated. Treat others the way you wanna be treated. See, what's great about this is at the heart of this is about viewing people the way that God views other people. See, in God's eyes, regardless of race, religion, background, orientation, or beliefs, all of mankind is an image bearer of him that all humanity inherently has value as image bearers of God. All humanity inherently has values as image bearers of God. Now look, unless somebody knows Jesus to be Lord and Savior of their life and through repentance and grace, like they might not be a child of God. They may not have been adopted into the family of God, but they still have value as an image bearer of God. God. Keep in mind here, Micah is writing to a group of people that would forcibly confiscate other people's land or possessions for their gain, that treated others inhumanely, and that would cheat others for financial gain. Like, this is the exact opposite of what it was supposed to look like to be God's people in the land. In fact, when God established this people, he gave to them a law in the book of Deuteronomy, and he wrote into that law protections for people like foreigners, the poor, slaves, orphans, widows, and basically anybody who was vulnerable to be taken advantage of. God wrote in protections for them into his law. See, part of doing justice is caring for those who are hurting, who are abused, who are neglected, who are vulnerable, or who have been cast aside. And these people have value in God's eyes. And if we're, we're pursuing Jesus in our life, man, then they have to have value in our lives. And we have to treat them justly and even pursue justice for them. So if somebody is crying out that they're being taken advantage of, whether it's, it's a company that's degrading its employees or a community that feels like it's just been pushed aside or refugees that have been neglected, if your first response upon hearing those cries is to roll your eyes or just get angry at them or, or look for ways that they're wrong or accuse them, like if that's your very first response, look, you've probably got trash in your heart because doing justice means seeking truth and exposing lies, and standing up for those who can't. That is what is required of you. So Micah says, look, do justice. And then the next thing he tells us is to love kindness. Love kindness. He says, don't just show mercy, but love to show it. Like give other people the same measure of mercy that you would wanna receive from them. See, somewhere along the way, our culture has lost this value of kindness. Like, at some point in time, if you haven't already, you're gonna get on social media, and within five minutes, you're gonna see a lot of anger, right? Like, somebody's posting something angry, or they're, like, fighting in the comments, and they're just yelling at each other, or whatever it could be, and, and it's crazy. Like, my sister recently sold her house, uh, and if you are looking for a house or uh, have like are selling a house, it is a crazy market out there. Like, everything is expensive, including my sister's house. Like, it was expensive, okay? And, and so she got it for sale. She worked hard. She put everything together. She shared on Facebook that she was selling her house. She shared the post. Her realtor shared the post. Um, I'm a phenomenal brother, so I shared the post, right? Uh, and what was crazy is to see people's reaction to this. 
Like I'm driving in the car uh, with my wife Ashley and our daughters in the back and uh, we're going to get ice cream at the place with the elephants right up here. Anybody else go to the place with the elephants? Y'all, that is like Disney World in our family, okay? <laughs> our budget for ice cream is like higher than our mortgage, okay? It is crazy how much money we spend there. They should like have a cone named after me, okay? But we're driving to the place with the elephants and my wife is, is just reading the comment section to me of this post from my sister's house uh, and it's absurd. It's absurd, like people are angry and yelling at each other, like complete strangers yelling at other complete strangers about the house, about the location, about the price, about the market, about where she posted it, and about the fact that her realtor posted it. Like people would come in and just like drop their angry two cents, like, oh, it's got a playset. I hate playsets. They're dangerous. <laughs> and like they go out of the comment section and you're like, what, what was that? Just ridiculous, crazy stuff. And like, we see this online all the time, right? Like in social media, we see angry stuff all of the time. It's everywhere. It's just a microcosm, guys, of our culture as a whole. Like we're angry about everything. <laughs> there is no kindness anymore. Because like something happens in the news or it happens in your community or like wherever else, and people immediately just like log on into uh, Facebook or Twitter and they just like yell angry stuff into the online void. Like, rawr, it's awful, they suck, I hate them, rawr, right? And like we just see this anger everywhere. And as a culture, man, we are so quick to degrade people because of their anything, <laughs> really. Look, let me help you out. If you can't get on social media without getting angry, or commenting something mean, or posting something uh, degrading about somebody else, even if that person is like famous or, I don't know, political, like here, let me help you out. Just get off Facebook. You've got trash in your heart. You've got trash in your heart. You go to forgot password, you put a new one in, just slap the keyboard so you have no idea what it is and take a break. I promise you will still stay informed and you'll probably wind up being a much happier person in the long run. Look, Micah says that God requires us not just to be kind, but to love kindness. And that means finding joy and being merciful to somebody else. And that means being gentle with how you talk to somebody that you disagree with. That means that when you have the opportunity to do something for somebody else, you jump at it because it just fills you with joy. See, like you've seen these kind of people before, right? Like they're rare, but these extremely kind, these people who love kindness, like we love being around them because when we're around these people, like we're gonna benefit. We invite them to Christmas or like Thanksgiving because like they're super kind. They're gonna say nice things about us. They're gonna do nice things and we just love being around them. They bring joy to our lives. Like if your social media interactions, if your discussions, if your conversations uh, with people or about people, man, could you imagine if that was just bathed in kindness? Like what a change that could make in our world. Like I honestly believe that if our interactions showed that we loved kindness, I think it would cause people to stop and think about the degrading or angry or mad posts that they make a whole lot more than if we just log on and start yelling at them about it. And so Micah says, look, hey, do justice. Love kindness. And then he says, walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with your God. As I was reading through this, I came across this quote by uh, Charles Spurgeon. Uh, he's a, an old uh, pastor and theologian, and he said this about humility. He said, true humility is thinking rightly of thyself, not meanly. When you have found out what you really are, you will be humble, for you are nothing to boast of. To be humble will make you safe. To be humble will make you happy. To be humble will make music in your heart when you go to bed. To be humble here will make you wake up in the likeness of your master by and by. See, walking humbly with God means recognizing who you are in the presence of who God is. Grab that for a second. Walking humbly with God means recognizing who you are in the presence of who God is. 
The truth is, no matter how many things we do or personas that we try to put up or roles that we try to play, all of us, all of us have trash in the corners of our hearts. We all have things that we're not proud of. We all have decisions that we've made that are separate from who it is that God created us to be. And when we recognize our brokenness in comparison to the wholeness of a perfect and powerful God, man, it should move us to places of both worship and humility. Recognizing our place as broken and rebellious people, and yet God still loves us enough to pursue us and send his son, Jesus, to make a way to bring us back to him. Like recognizing that should cause us to cast aside the role, to take care of our trash and instead, man, to run toward our creator and to fall in love with the things that he loves. See, my freshman year before, um, before I went to college, uh, I spent the summer working out four days a week at a program designed specifically for football players. Yes, I played football, okay? Um, <laughs> and like I said, small Christian school that I went to in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, and I'm going in, I'm excited to be able to play. I join on with this program. And the weird part, what I realized early on was I was the only non-Division I athlete at this program. No idea why they even let me in the door. Like, I'm working out with guys who played football at Miami, Ohio, the University of Cincinnati, the University of Kentucky. They even had a linebacker for the Cincinnati Bengals who came in and would just be like, poof, heavy. And you'd be like, wow, that's really cool. Can I have your audit? No, he's gone. Okay, cool. Like, the, all of these really phenomenal, big, strong, fast guys. And then there was me. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to talk about humility? Uh, try having your lifting partner every time take off half the weight from his bench press so that you can just like try to get that thing up there one time, right? Like that'll humble you real quick, okay? Uh, this guy uh, right here, his name is John Connor. Uh, for those of uh, you comic nerds or movie nerds, not from Terminator, okay? Somebody asked me about that. Uh, this is John Connor. Uh, he went to a local high school where I grew up. He played football as a fullback at the University of Kentucky and then a little brief stint in the NFL. Uh, this was my lifting partner most of the time. Yeah, right? Uh, John could have eaten me alive at anything. He was so far superior to me in every athletic way possible. Like he could, he was faster, he was stronger, he was, you name it, better than me. Like I was humbled to be around John. Like he would lift stuff and I would just be like, wow, where's my cinnamon roll, right? Like this guy was incredible, all right? I love being around John. I was humbled by how physically phenomenal he was. But what was even more incredible was every time I went in and lifted, not a single time did John make me feel bad about myself. Not a single time did he complain about all of the weights we had to take on and off to be lifting partners. He cared about me. He asked what position I played. He asked where I went to school. He asked what my goals were. He asked to know more about who I was. He didn't have to do any of that. He never cast me aside. He never ignored me. He never just didn't pay attention to me. I was completely humbled by how physically fit John was. But I was even more humbled by how much he was invested in me. See, walking humbly with God will humble you when you realize how incredible the creator and maintainer of the entire universe is. But what will motivate you to change is the humility you feel when you recognize how invested and how in love with you he is. See, all three of those principles, all three of those ideas to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God, they're all forms of love. All of these are forms of love. See, this teaching may be old, but it's so true that if you wanna get rid of the hidden trash out of your nice looking appearance of a life, you gotta start shoveling it out with love as the motivator. It's the model that Jesus showed us of, of dying to self so that we could benefit Others And in doing that, man, we begin to recognize that prestige, that influence, that appearances, money, power, and whatever else is just fleeting. It's unfulfilling because, look, we weren't designed for just ourselves. 
We were designed to worship our creator and to care for each other. See, some of us have to put the persona of who we want the world to see us as aside. And we gotta deal with the trash in the corner. Anybody who's around you long enough is gonna begin to smell it and notice it anyway. Like, you, you can't play that role forever. You wanna, you wanna do what you were designed to do? Be who you were designed to be? You wanna make a difference in your life? You wanna feel real joy and real peace? You wanna become something before God? And do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly with your God. And then God will rightly be glorified and you will become who God created you to be. Let's pray together, church. God, you are incredible. You are incredible, Father. We are humble before not only your majesty and your glory and your presence, God, but Lord, we are humbled in your pursuit of us. God, we've got, we've got trash in the corner of our hearts in some, in some way, shape, or form, God, but you don't, you don't give up on us for that. God, as we pursue you, Father, as we pursue growing towards your son, Jesus, Lord, may we begin to, to do the things that you do, God. May we begin to do justice in this broken world. May we begin to, to love kindness where there is anger, Father, and Lord, we, may we be moved to walk humbly in your presence, Lord. We praise you and you alone, Jesus. And we pray all of these things in your name. Amen.